Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. You're listening to the Frugal Crafter podcast, blogcast. I'm not sure exactly what I should call this, but anyway, you're here and I'm here and let's talk about arts and crafts and all of that good stuff. Um, this is actually a follow-up on last week's podcast where we talked about uh, people going on an art and craft supply no-buy this year. And I got some really awesome comments on YouTube about this topic. And I decided to do a follow-up because it's obviously something that a lot of people are interested in and also struggling with. So, um, so I thought I would offer uh, maybe some ideas for you to think about, maybe to implement if you are trying to go on a no-buy or low-buy this year, or basically just inject the joy back into your art making and crafting processes. Because I know sometimes it's kind of like when you look at the closet and you're like, I don't have a thing to wear. And it's like, you have the same amount of clothes you had like a couple months ago when you were excited about your wardrobe, but for whatever reason, the zest just isn't there. And that happens in all aspects of our life. And I think especially in our creative life, we buy these supplies, we're all excited about using them. And then they kind of sit on the shelf and we forget about them. And then something new comes out. And then we think, oh, I wish I got that instead. Or just we get used to the stuff or forget about the stuff. And then it just kind of becomes a burden rather than a tool for enjoyment and creativity. So this podcast is going to be all about how to stop collecting and start using your supplies. Uh, so if you like, um, I'm just going to kind of give you some, instead of this, do this, because I think a lot of times when we try to cut something out cold turkey, we, and we don't have anything to replace it, it can be really easy to fall off the wagon and go back into our own ha old habits that we don't want to repeat. So maybe one of your uh, your habits and results is you watch a haul video or you watch a review video for a new product and you get all excited about it and then you go and buy the product and the product arrives and then maybe um, you either forgot uh, what you wanted to do with the product or maybe your uh, it's not meeting your expectations. Maybe it's a new set of color pencils and you get it and you start using it and you're like, you know, these really aren't any better than the ones I already had. And so you're kind of disappointed. Maybe you feel bad for making that purchase. Maybe you feel a little embarrassed for making the purchase. I think a lot of times shame comes into play when we, um, especially with a habit like shopping that we're trying to get over um, or curb a bit. And then, you know, the cycle starts again. Then we're like, well, let's, I'm going to watch another video and get another hit of inspiration. And then, you know, the cycle cont continues. So instead of watching reviews for new products, try watching reviews for stuff you already have. One of my favorite supplies that I don't use nearly enough are the, um, the Caran d'Ache Neocolor 2 water soluble crayons. I love those things. Every time I use them, I say, why don't I use these more? These are so wonderful. And every once in a while, I will look up a review or look up a project with those because I know that that's going to reignite my um, interest in the supply and maybe even give me some new tips and tricks to try that I haven't used before because I tend to use them kind of thickly, opaquely, kind of like a stick of gouache, basically. Uh, so it's kind of nice to see what other people are doing. Or maybe you got something recently and you haven't used it as much as you'd hoped. So going back and finding tutorials or reviews with that project that you had, that product that you had to have a few months ago can also reignite that spark and make something older new again. Now, if you like watching haul videos, because it's fun to see what's new, I get it. I do that same thing. I'm, I'm curious about what's coming out. So uh, I want to see what's new when I watch a haul video, but oftentimes it does uh, kind of rile up the want monster. That's what I call the, uh, the kind of devil on my shoulder that wants to buy all the new art supplies. So it kind of kind of want like ignites the want monster. Then eventually he gets out of the cage. He goes crazy, buys some stuff, and then you know I'm stuck with the consequences. So if that's you as well, instead of watching the new haul videos, watch an older one. Watch one from like five or six or seven years ago. A lot of those products will not be able to be purchased anymore, and some of the tried and true ones you may have already bought. So you can get excited about those projects and those products and uh, shop your stash basically because that's really what um, what we want to do more. We want to use what we have so that we feel good about what we bought. And that makes you more creative. I think when you, when you feel happy about what you have around you, you feel secure in the stuff you have around you to create with. And you also feel like um, you have permission to use it. And I know sometimes we get, we get kind of afraid, like we fall in love with a product and we're like, Oh, we're going to run out. We better buy more before we run out. What if I can't get this again? Um, that's something that I struggle with a bit, but just, just, just know that if, if that product goes discontinued and you can't find it anymore, there'll be something similar. There's always something um, 
there's always something similar that you can buy. So something I talked about last week, and I just want to reiterate this because this is something that um, I've always done is I try to think, do I have something I can use? Let me try what I have first. And this goes back to being a kid growing up in a rural area. We didn't go to the store that often. Um, you know, this was way before internet. You might have had some catalogs or something, but if I saw a project in a magazine or um, on television or something, rather than saying, I need to have that exact same color, that exact same brush, that exact same bead, I would say, okay, let me see what I have and see what I can make first. And I would just make whatever it was, whether it be a necklace or a painting or whatever with the stuff I had on hand. And the best thing about that is that you ended up with something completely original and creative. And I still do that with like, um, with bead, uh, bead video or bead magazines. I haven't picked up a bead magazine in a while, but um, there was this one, I think it was um, Bead Style Magazine, had like so many projects in it that I wanted to try. I did not have those exact beads they had because I mean like, and I wasn't about to order th these specific beads for these projects, but I'm like, you know, I have a pretty good assortment of beads I could pick from. And I picked similar in size ones, similar in shape ones, and I made my projects and I really liked how they came out. They were fun and I got to use what I have. So when you are thinking about inspiration like that online, whether you're going to a bookstore and you're going to buy a book or a magazine, or you're just surfing online, maybe looking at, um, uh, well, sometimes even catalogs like Fire Mountain Gems and whatnot, different different catalogs and YouTube channels that are owned by bead companies, they'll have some really great tutorials, really great ideas. Um, you can take the inspiration and see if you can create it with what you have. And I think that's a really great place to start because even if it doesn't work out exactly the way the tutorial worked out and it doesn't turn out exactly like the finished project you saw online or in a magazine, it's going to be something. It's going to be unique. And if it doesn't work, you can always take it apart and remake it if it's like a, a piece of jewelry or and then decide, OK, I'm going to buy the thing. Or you may just kind of go off, like use that as kind of like um, uh, a, like you're climbing up a tree and this this first branch you climbed out on, you think you're going to make this this one project. But then as you see what other supplies you have available, you branch out differently and and then you make something that's totally your own. And I think that's wonderful. And um, I don't think we should be striving to make cookie cutter creations. I know in uh, one, probably the, the craft world that I'm the most involved in would probably be card making and rubber stamping. And um, a lot of these influencers make beautiful cards and they're very inspiring, but they share a lot of techniques. And if you pick apart the tutorial and you say, okay, that is a beautiful card, but I don't need to make that card again. If you want to, please feel free to. Um, I think most everyone I know that posts videos online post tutorials they intend people to try it and make it they're not offended by that they want you to try it and make it yourself but if you're looking at uh say a card that's made with a layering flower set and it's a brand new one and you don't have that one but you have one from a few years ago that you absolutely love we use that first maybe you love that type of stamp and you're like oh you know what i really love this type of stamp i think i'm going to go buy this other type of flower that's made by that company because i just really like it i know the quality is good and i would use it and i would enjoy it me, on the other hand, uh, I love the look of layering stamps, but doing them, uh, I love the look. I like how they come out and uh, and I I like the designs, but whenever I'm in the midst of one of these projects, I'm like, oh, I remember. I don't like this type of project. <laughs> and it's kind of good to remind yourself of that with what you already have, because we can get fooled into thinking this one's going to be different. I'm going to like this. There's just certain techniques that I don't like. There's certain techniques that you don't like. And if you could remind yourself of that before buying, buying the same product in a different style again, you're going to save money and you can put that money towards things that you actually will use. And I'm a big believer in supporting those companies that make high quality products that treat their employees well, that um, are constantly innovating with designs and not just copycatting other companies. So spending the money you have there at those stores is wonderful, but make sure you're buying something that you're going to actually use. And that isn't just going to sit on a shelf and make you feel bad in the future. Uh, another thing I recommend, and this is actually uh, it, it is kind of buying something. It is having a stock of basics in your stash. And I've always believed in this because I think partially growing up in a rural area where you didn't have a chance to just run to a store when you ran out of something, you kept you kept a, a stocked house, you kept a stocked pantry, you kept a, stop, a stocked art room, you kept a stocked library. You want to make sure that um, you weren't just going to run out in the middle of something. And, uh, and you just kept basics. You didn't keep every single contingency for every single occasion, but you would have a variety of things. It could be used in a variety of different ways. And I think coming from an art background, um, 
all, all of that stock that I had from teaching classes and doing multimedia projects, those all came around in one iteration or another in the card making world and in the, the scrapbooking world and in the general crafting world. So having that basics of, well, I have watercolors, I have dyes, I have yarn, I have ribbon, I have fabric. All these trends came and came and went, but I had stuff that I could use with them. I had these really interesting collage papers, mulberry papers for collaging on paintings. I had cardstock. I had all of these different art and craft supplies because they were basics and they could be used in so many different ways. So I would say, you know, have the basics, have a good stock of the basics. And before you buy something that's really specific, ask yourself if you're going to use it up because those specific things are the things that tend to look dated, that tend to go out of style. Um, anything with adhesive on it, like washi tape or stickers or embellishments that are self-adhesive or like I, uh, um, for Valentine's Day one year, my mother gave me this huge assortment of the die cut belt by Queen and Company. And it was, it's so pretty. It's so pretty, right? And I had to save it for the best project. Well, now the adhesive has like fused to the backing and kind of turned yellow. And it's like, oh, I should have just used it. I should have used that stuff on every project I wanted to back then instead of saving that, saving it for the best project, because um, I have more than, I, I had plenty. I had more than could be used up before the trend was over. And yet I still kind of hoarded it. So if it was a basic supply that I knew I'd be able to go buy again, I wouldn't have hoarded it. I would have just, um, I would have just used it up and then bought more when I needed to, like a sheet of felt versus getting some bespoke die cut piece of felt. You could buy a sheet of felt and then cut it out yourself. Or um, even actually the die cut felt, if I think back at that, it looks a lot like the velour paper and velour paper. I could easily cut in a die cut machine. Um, I could easily cut by hand. I could do whatever I wanted to get that effect. Um, so when you do see a new trend, think, do I have something that could do that effect? If I'm thinking about buying, say, die cut felt, could I die cut some fuzzy velour paper I have? Could I use some double sided adhesive I have or some glue and use flocking? If I have flocking, that's kind of a basic supply that comes back in style. It kind of goes out and comes back in the stamping world every, um, I don't know, probably every eight or so years. Can I use that? Um, if you have the basics, that will, that will really hold you over and allow you to create without feeling the need that you have to go out and buy because you know there's only so many supplies there's just different iterations of it the next thing i want to talk about is having uh keeping in mind the shelf life of anything that you're thinking about buying so if you are at the store and you see a really good deal on the glue that you like um Oftentimes stores will clearance these products because they're getting close to the end of the shelf life. So they want to get rid of them so they can bring in new stock so that if somebody buys a product there, they know it's going to last for a couple of years or whatever the, the typical shelf life is. So like for glues, that might be a couple of years if stored properly. So you've got to make sure you have space in like a temperature controlled environment to store them. You've got to make sure you'll actually use them in that time frame before they're going to go bad. And um, certain things like acrylic paints, glues, that can they can go by fairly quickly, especially the bottled acrylic paints that are uh, more liquid. The tube paints will last a lot longer and the more artist grade paints will last a lot longer. But also you're probably less likely to stock up on those because they're very expensive generally. Resin, that's got like about a six to 12 month lifespan before it can start to go yellow or maybe even harden up in the jar. So you certainly don't want to go buy a gallon of resin if you make maybe a handful of necklaces every year. It just doesn't make sense. But I also know the impulse to do this because I know when I started using resin, I was making some stuff. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. But it's, boy, these little bottles are so expensive. I think I'll buy the, you know, half gallon of, I got polyester resin. You have to have, you add just a few drops of hardener to it. That stuff was so toxic, so stinky. Um, I, it went hard in the can before I even got a chance to use it. And that was a, that was kind of an expensive lesson learned. Um, luckily I bought it with a 40% off coupon from AC Moore, but still it was an expensive lesson to learn. And, uh, that kind of cured me of buying resin ahead of time. And, and a lot of things that would just go by, go bad. I actually had to throw away a brand new full bottle of Gorilla Glue last week because I went to open it and it had completely hardened inside the bottle and it was capped up properly. It was stored properly, but you know, they just don't last that long. And I've found that the way I use Gorilla Glue, for instance, I am much better off getting those single serving little, um, little aluminum containers of it, kind of like how super glue comes because uh, there's about three servings in one of those little, those little things. And by the time I actually need to use them, if I had a big bottle, it would just go bad. And the other, they're all like foil sealed. So 
they don't typically go bad and you get like five in a package. So yes, way more expensive. Unfortunately, there's more, more packaging um, in those single serve things, but I'm not throwing away an unused bottle because it hardens. So I think it's a net gain. And then I have the product when it's ready. So I needed to glue something. I needed to glue a, a ferrule back on a brush. The brush was damp. It was a perfect situation for Gorilla Glue um, because you have to, you it's for gluing wet surfaces and it expands and it just really marries two surfaces really well. But I couldn't use it because it was dry and I wasn't going to drive half an hour to the city to buy a single, you know, to buy more and then come back and then do the project. It was literally something I just wanted to get done. I ended up using another glue that would work. So yes, use, see if you have something that will work and use what will work. But, um, but yeah, that was a bummer. So that's something I learned. Just get the single serve versions of a lot of those specialty glues because I'm a pretty simple adhesive person. I use my ATG gun. Those adhesives don't seem to go bad for a long time. I use some score tape. I'll use permanent glue sticks by either Avery or Scotch. And, uh, and I don't buy those ahead of time because glue sticks are another thing that aren't going to last um, for that long. I learned my lesson on that during all the Target back to school sales when I used to buy, um, you know, back to school stuff for the kids. I would stock up on crayons and glue sticks and rulers and safety scissors and all of that stuff. Uh, so I learned my lesson on that. Luckily, it wasn't an expensive lesson, but still, you hate to throw away, you know, plastic and, and junk like that when it's, you know, totally avoidable. Uh, just learning how much you use, I think, is also a really smart thing when you're trying to figure out how much to keep on hand and how much to buy. And make sure you have the proper conditions to store anything. So watercolor paper. Watercolor paper can last a long time if you have proper storage conditions. You could go to an art store and you could find watercolor paper that's decades old. If the art store has perfect conditions, it shouldn't be a problem. I know somebody who bought a ton of Wattman watercolor paper from the 70s at auction and is still using it today, um, but it was stored properly and he's still using it. It's also a very heavily sized paper, so it has a little more protection. But I also know people that have had Arches paper go bad, have sketchbooks go bad. I've had um, the paper that tends to go bad on me is the Strathmore 400 series. Um, and it's such a bummer because if it's a nice paper that you love that is kind of expensive, maybe you bought it on sale because you wanted to stock up, but it's just a complete waste of money if you can't use it the way you need to use it. Now, the paper where the sizing has gone bad, what I recommend doing is using it for gouache or using it for pastel. You can even do like a underpainting and then use pastel over it. It's going to work fine for that. But if you wanted that paper for watercolor, because watercolor, I think, is a little bit more finicky and you really want those nice papers for watercolor because it lets the beauty of the medium show so well. Um, you know, it's nice that you can use it for something else, but it is a real bummer if you bought that paper to use it for watercolor and then you can't. So um, the way I keep my watercolor paper in good condition, and I have some that is quite old, I have a big box under my bed and the room is the room does not fluctuate in temperature or humidity, humidity that much throughout the course of the year. And I keep it there. I don't keep it down in my basement studio because I know we're going to have some temperature fluctuations. There's going to be some humidity fluctuations and I don't want to risk that expensive paper. And I did stock up when it was on sale. So I, I am... I have a hoard of watercolor paper. Do I have more than I could probably use up in my lifetime? Potentially. Potentially I do. I rarely buy it now. Um, when I get papers in to read, unless it's something I know that I will use, like I like find a good deal on arches um, and I'm doing a class, I will, I will stock up on that. But um, in general, in general, I'm not, I'm no, not buying watercolor paper. I have a, I kind of have a set point for certain products where um, it's like a product I love, a product I know I'll use up. So if it drops below a certain price that I will give myself permission to buy. And even when I had my studio downtown and I was kind of the quote unquote starving artist, I had a certain fund where um, for certain supplies, if they hit a certain price, I would stock up. And it was a business expense. I'd use it in my classes, but I just, I knew I would use it. I know that's a favorite and I would, I would buy it if, if it hit a certain price. So, you know, if you're, if you're contemplating doing a no buy, but you're like, but what if there's a really great deal and I would never afford it, this thing otherwise, make yourself a list of those things that you would want to buy if it has a certain price point, write down the, write, make the list, write down the price. And then if it hits that, then buy it because that's an intentional per that would be an intentional purpose. That's a purchase. That's something you're thinking about today. You know that that's something that you want to have in your stash. You'd love to be able to own it. It's just not in your budget now, but if it hit this price, then you would allow yourself to get it. That would be totally acceptable, I think. And then you're also not buying all those little trinkets that are kind of the replacements for the, um, 
for the thing you really want, the lesser quality thing of the item that you actually really want. And I see this so often, especially in the art communities. Actually, it's more like the, um, it's probably more the crafting, like the stamping and the colored pencil communities or the adult coloring communities on Facebook. I'll see people asking about budget pencils and they'll buy a bunch of budget sets because say they really want polychromos from Faber-Castell, but they, they can't afford it. So they're like, well, I'm going to buy this $30 set. Oh, I'm not happy with that one. I'm going to buy this one. So they end up buying three or four $30 sets over the course of um, six months. Well, they could have saved up that money and they could have uh, waited till the favorite castells go on sale and they could have bought what they really wanted probably for less money and then been really happy with their purchase. So, you know, it's something to think about. It's just being more intentional, even if you still shop, which I mean, we're all going to, you're going to save money in the long run and end up with better supplies in the bargain. I think uh, another thing that was um, that was really hold on. If I sound like I'm reading, it's because I am. I am. <laughs> I'm looking at my list and I kind of skipped ahead. Uh, something I ask myself when I'm trying to rationalize buying something or not buying something, I will say, "Will I outlive this supply?" And I think about that with my watercolor palettes all the time. I have a collection of travel watercolor palettes and watercolor tins. I don't know what it is. They, they spark joy. Like some people that collect commemorative plates or a thumb, a thumb, what do you call them? Thimbles or spoons or whatever, you know, it's a collection that I really enjoy having. I use them all. I don't, none of them are like pristine or anything. Um, and it does, it does bring me joy as a collection, but I think about that and I'm like, yeah, I could probably paint every single day and not use up all the paint that I have, all the watercolor I have. And that's something to think of. It's a sobering thought. Um, I've never like tried to calculate it out or anything, but I kind of wish that, uh, and I'm sure there'll be some like AI algorithm that could probably calculate this out, but it's like, you know, how long would I have to live to use this up? Or when will this supply run out if I use it every day or something like that? I think if we could run that, that, um, equation in some sort of simulator and we could see, oh, if you paint it every day, you would still have three pads. You know, you, you would take you 87 years to use all this up or, or whatever, you know, uh, there would be no way to calculate it perfectly. But I think that would give us a, a bit of relief and a bit of permission to start using our stuff. Um, there, another thing to do is think about future you. And I think a lot of times we do this when we're, when we're buying supplies, I've heard so many times somebody say, I'm going to buy this because when I retire, I'm not going to have the money to spend on craft supplies. So I'm going to buy it now that I'm working. I'm going to buy these things now that I'm working, but I'm like, but if you save that money, you would have that money when you're retired to buy our supplies if you want to. So that logic never really, never really made sense to me. So if you can think of that, think of like, I'm going to save this money so that I can buy the art supplies when I'm retired instead of I'm going to buy this thing now so I'll have it when I'm retired. And I know prices go up and all of that, but if you save that money in a high yield savings account, it's going to grow a little bit fat. It's like 4.3% is what my high yield savings account is getting. Um, it'll grow a little bit better than inflation. So it should, you know, you should still be able to buy that same pad of paper or whatever when you retire. Or when you retire, you may be like, I don't have the energy, I don't have the time, I don't have the interest, I'd rather travel. And you may be glad to have that you'd probably be rather you rather have that money than to have that thing in your house i listened to a uh, ted talk the other day and according to research done by joseph cable he did mris on people and he had them ask like think about themselves in the present and they had them think about a celebrity and then they had him th had them think about themselves in the future and the same parts of their brains lit up when they thought about like a celebrity or a stranger as it did when they thought about themselves in the future so there's a bit of a mental disconnect that we have between our present selves and our future selves so knowing that um that's why we want to we want to you know, eat the delicious food now. We want to buy the thing now. We want the instant gratification because we don't think of our future selves as a real person or as a person we know. Certainly not a person we are. Uh, if you, if that's giving you the same brain sensations, thinking about your future self as thinking about a stranger, then you don't, you're not necessarily going to want to save that money for future you to buy the supply they want at the time they need it when they're retired. Things don't last when, when you, if you're just going to like hoard a bunch of stuff and throw it in, in totes in your basement, they're going to get, they're going to, a lot of things will kind of deteriorate if you're not actively using them, keeping, maintaining them, keeping them clean, keeping them dusted, keeping them tidy and organized. They just kind of deteriorate. If you've ever seen like old decorations, like with silk flowers on them or pine cones, you know, you just see stuff kind of fall apart and deteriorate. And it's not very fresh and pretty looking, not inspiring. So 
think about your future self. I do that at night when I'm getting ready for bed. I'm like, I'm tired. I just want to go to bed, but I'm thinking about future me. I'm going to set up the coffee maker. I'm going to wipe down the counters. I'm going to make the kitchen something I want to wake up to in the morning. Even though I don't feel like it, I know that I will appreciate it when I walk downstairs the next day and future me will appreciate it. Just like when I exercise every day, I am, I mean, I'm doing it for, for present me's sense of well-being, but I'm also doing it for future, future me's health span. And, um, you know, physicality and I want to be healthy and I, and I want to, you know, I want to have a long, healthy life, not just a long life. So, um, try to think about future you as you and, um, say, save that money that you think that you're, if you're thinking about buying something so you can use it in retirement, think, is it really going to last? Am I really going to want to do that? We are very bad at anticipating what our future selves will want to do because as we've seen, we think of them as strangers, right? So maybe future you, you buy this pottery wheel and yeah, I have a pottery wheel. You buy this pottery wheel because you think you're going to do pottery when you retire, but anticipating how you're going to feel when you're retired. Are you going to have the arm strength? Are you going to have the wrist strength? Are you going to want to be covered in clay, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe slow your roll a bit, go to a pottery studio, studio, take a class and see if you even like it before you buy the thing that you think future you is going to want. But I thought that was a really interesting, um, really interesting research that was done. And I'm like, Oh, I've got a, that, and that was perfect. So I was listening to it the other day, right after I recorded the last podcast, I was out shoveling, um, off the deck and I was like, Oh, that is good. I've got to, I've got to make a note of that. So, um, yeah, think, think of future you and what's going to be better for your long-term creativity, your long-term health, your long-term financial security, and, um, make your decisions based on that. This was just going to be like a 15 minute podcast. I can't believe I'm still talking about this, um, but I hope you find it helpful. So this next tip was really just kind of like, um, kind of like phew, mind blown when I heard this. Uh, I think it was in Marie Kondo's second book, Spark Joy. As you may have known, I don't know if you've been followed, if you followed my YouTube channel, but I did a big KonMari declutter back in, uh, I think it was 2017. And uh, I went through the entire house and I did my craft supplies last uh, because I was probably the most sentimentally attached to my art and craft supplies. But um, I listened to the audiobook, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. It is a, it's a quick read too, if you want to just read the book, but I, find li I found listening to it while I was decluttering to be very motivational. And then I listened to her second book called Spark joy which went to a little bit more um uh, went in a little more in depth on some of the topics that she talked about and one of the things she said that just blew my mind was store it at the store and that just never occurred to me and i think it's going back to the rural upbringing you always had backups at home because um also living in maine we'd had times where we would have lost the power for a week or there was a flood one year where we couldn't leave our home. So we had to have stuff stored. We had uh, gardens and we canned vegetables and, you know, you were just, everybody was self-sustainable. Basically you all, you know, had a, had a stockpile and you made sure that you could get through the winter if something happened. And so I think that Yankee ingenuity has always been ingrained, but you know, the, the old timers weren't out there buying a bunch of stuff. They were very practical about it. But I think we can also kind of think of, okay, what if we run out? I better have these backups. But stored at the store made so much sense. And um, I do want to attribute that to Marie Kondo. So instead of buying all those backups when you're while you're out there, or for me, when those when they had those 40% off coupons all the time, it's like if I was in town and I had a Michael's coupon or an AC Moore coupon or a Joanne's coupon, and I almost felt like if I didn't go in, I, I felt it like it was like a gift certificate. Like if I didn't go in and spend it, then I was just throwing money away. And, but then it was kind of like, well, I have everything I want. Um, you know, they didn't change your stamps over that often or their papers over that often. They didn't carry the the best art supplies. So I pretty much had everything I wanted, but gosh, I didn't want to waste that 40% off gift certificate, you know, coupon, come on. Um, and so I'd buy something, I'd buy like some glue or I'd buy an extra bottle of paint or I'd buy, you know, just something that I would use up eventually a marker or whatever. Um, but then I found that some of those things went bad and I was making a special trip out just to basically spend money. It wasn't, I mean, they weren't giving these things away. They knew exactly what they were doing with those coupons. Um, so when I heard store it at the store, I was like, yeah, I don't need to buy that extra adhesive because when I'm really close to running out of adhesive and I'm in town next, I can just zip in there and buy it. And even if I don't have a coupon, so what, you know, at least I don't have to store it here where it can go bad or I can lose it. Um, 
but I think that I did backslide a little bit and maybe you did too during the pandemic when the stores were shut down and everyone was getting into arts and crafts and things were getting really expensive and going out of stock and it was hard to get what you wanted. So that kind of made me a little bit afraid and kind of like made me want to hoard things again or, you know, just kind of hang on to stuff that I ordinarily would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to use all this. I'll donate it to the school, donate it to the scouts or donate it to <clears throat> my friend who was a Montessori school. I was kind of hanging on to stuff. They weren't the, the first tier products. They were things that I had probably been sent to review and I'd done the review and it's like, I really don't need this because I have something I like better. I would had I would have just given it away, but then I was like, well, maybe I should hang on to it because if I run out of that, I might not be able to get it again. These companies might go out of business. The pandemic was really scary, but we're through that now and um, and I've been able to come kind of come back to a sense of reason and, uh, and store things back at the, the store again. Another thing that helps me not buy stuff is to uh, <laughs> is to go by this rule of thumb, and I do this for clothing too because I'm I'm not that picky, but I hate to return things. Um, I need to try try something on before I buy it, and I don't like a lot of clutter in my wardrobe. I don't want to have to think too hard when I get dressed in the morning. I just want to put it on a pair of jeans and a sweater or whatever and just go on my day or put on a sundress if it's the summer and just go on with my day. So I have a rule where I don't buy it on sale if I wouldn't pay full price for it. So that keeps you from buying the stuff that's, oh, well, it's a good deal. It's it's okay. I could wear it around the house. Um, I got plenty of things to wear around the house. I got plenty of paint stained clothes I can wear around the house. I don't need to buy something that's just okay to wear around the house. So if it's not good enough that I wouldn't pay full price for it, I don't buy it. And I still try to buy things on sale and whatnot, but I go by that. Um, I go by that rule. If I wouldn't pay full price, I don't buy it. And the same goes with craft supplies. If this isn't something that I really want to add to my limited space, then no, no deal is a good deal. It's not a bargain if you don't use it. There was a, a book that I read um, called Goodbye Things, and it was uh, it was really it was kind of really transformational. I, I read this after I had done the KonMari. It was kind of like a good um, a keep yourself in check type of book, but it was by this uh, Japanese minimalist. And I wrote his name down here, Fumo Sas uh, Sasuke, Sasuke. He said, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the book in front of me. I lent it to a friend. Um, he said, your stuff is like a roommate that doesn't pay rent. And he actually came, was like calculating, he had like a dresser, I think, and he was calculating what he was paying for rent and utilities and divided it up by the square footage of the house. And then he figured out how much square footage this bureau was taking up. And he's like, this is costing me, you know, $25 a month to keep. And I was like, wow, I never thought about it like that. I never thought about the stuff that we're storing actually costing us to keep. Like, what does that portion of our house cost to maintain to like the portion of rent or mortgage or utility bills or property tax? And that really, I, I think, gave permission to let some things go. So think about that too. When you buy this thing, it's going to take up space. So you don't, you don't buy this, this thing once and then you're done with it. You buy this thing and then... You've got to pay to maintain it, keep it clean. It's it's in the place of other things that you might want to have or space that you might want to use for yourself. If you've got a big chest of art supplies sitting in your corner, you can't use that corner for anything else. You can't sit in that corner. You can't exercise in that corner. You can't have a friend over and they sit in that corner. You're giving something up for everything you add. You're taking something away. Um, in the form of space, in the form of financial security in the future or for future you, in the terms of um, headspace that you've got to think about these things and manage these things. So it's not that you buy this thing once and you're done with it. There's a price. There's a price to dispose it if you decide you don't want it in the future. So think about the real cost of these things. And that's just our cost. That's not even considering the cost of the uh, environmental cost of the thing being made and then the thing being shipped to your store for you to buy. It could be a humanitarian cost. Did this thing, was this thing made by workers that were not paid fairly or enslaved workers? Was this thing, um, if like in the case of like, say a sable paintbrush, was like a life lost for you to have this thing? It's a definitely... If you really want to kind of talk yourself out of over consuming, think of the real cost of these products. What environmental cost was borne by the local 
community that part that made this thing is it something that's heavily polluting like like fashion is one of the heavily polluting things out there so i'm very mindful of what i buy for clothes i don't want to buy something and return it because returns often just get donated and donations often just get thrown to landfill so i want to make sure that i am being really intentional about what i buy and making sure i'm going to buy something that i'll wear out or i usually wear out i usually buy something and i wear it until it's too shabby and then i often just cut it up into rags if it's cotton or um you know or toss it if it's finally at the end of its life but it's i don't want to bring you down i don't want you guys to feel bad about the things that you buy but if you kind of think of all those external costs then it can help you keep in check a little bit because we all have a conscience right we all want to do right by our fellow human we want to do right by our future selves we want to do right by our present family and i mean if you think about should i buy this thing now if I buy these things now, will I be able to send my kids to college? Will I be able to retire when I'm 65 or I'm going to have to work until I'm 80 just because I want to have these things now? And uh, I think if you think of your time and how you spend your time, it's also a good way to keep yourself in check because time is the one thing we can't get back. Time is our only finite resource. So we don't want to waste that by having to work extra for these trinkets, right? These trinkets that we might not even appreciate. And uh, I guess the final thing that I'll recommend, and this is probably, this is very situational and not everybody is in, a, is in the position where they've got friends that like to do the same craft as they do, but maybe you can borrow a supply from somebody. I have such a stockpile or, and, I, and I have the opportunity to review a bunch of products for my work. So if somebody wants to borrow something, somebody that I know is like, geez, I'm thinking about buying that. Could I try yours? Absolutely. Try it and see if you like it before you buy it. And oftentimes they're going to try it and say, oh, you know what? That's just as good as what I have at home. I, I don't need this. I was curious, but yeah, maybe when I run out of this tube of phthalo blue, I'll buy that one from Da Vinci or M. Graham or core or whatever, but I, I don't need it now. It's, you know, it kind of um, it scratches that itch that you might have. Uh, if you don't have a friend you can borrow from, maybe watch some, watch some tutorials and you may see it in practice and be like, oh yeah, that's about the same as what I already have at home. I guess I don't need that thing. And you can put yourself on a buying moratorium. I know a lot of people do like a no spend month. I do that once in a while if I feel like I'm going off the rails a little bit, or maybe my two review pile has gotten a little high and it's like, I really need to get through these before I bring more in because I'm stressed out and overwhelmed and, and our supplies shouldn't make us feel that way. So you could do a, um, a 48 hour cooling off period, like make yourself wait 48 hours before you buy it. I know that can be so hard if there's something is like a, a really good sale. I know Amazon is so famous for, they'll post, uh, one of the sellers will post a really good sale on something. And as soon as like a certain amount gets sold, the price jacks up. And that's because there's, there's algorithms called repricers that sellers use and the Amazon itself will use to drum up interest in a product. It's usually the third party sellers because um, they wanna to get to the top of the search results on Amazon. So if a product is selling really fast, then Amazon will recommend it more. So, or it might even be a popular product, but there's like four or five different sellers selling it. So seller one might drop the price to like half off. And then once it has sold, hundred of them, it'll put the price right back up to where it was, or maybe even higher, but it will show up on the top of the search ranking because it, of how many units have sold. Uh, so little tactics like that can kind of also make us think, well, we got to buy it now or we're not going to be able to get that price. But again, if you could put yourself on a 48 hour kind of uh, think it over or cooling off period before you buy, then you can really think about it. Then then it goes to full price. And then you can say, well, would I pay full price for this? I guess I wouldn't pay full price for this. So I guess I didn't need it at half price. And you, know, you can always keep your eyes open. If you decide that, oh, darn it, I wish I had, had grabbed that. I know when I see something go on sale, I never want to pay full price. I don't ever want to pay more than what I saw that sale price for. So if you're kind of like that, then you can be like, if you felt a lot of regret, then the next time you see it go on sale, you can buy it because you've already had that cooling off period. You thought about it, you regretted it, and then you know you can grab it the next time. So I don't think it's ever a bad idea to wait. Um, and maybe your cooling off period needs to be a month or a week or whatever it is. But I know, especially in those situations where I see a really cool project and then I'm like, I didn't know that thing existed, but I feel like I have to have it now. If I never turned on that computer today, I never would have saw it. So I wouldn't know that I quote unquote need it. So giving myself a week or so to cool off 
I can think more critically about that because you're not in that heightened sense of excitement like you are when you first see that product. Um, I think that, uh, that shopping can be an addiction and it's one of those things that it's, it can seem harmless enough and it can be harmless enough, but if you feel overwhelmed by what you have, if you're feeling ashamed or bad about the art supplies or the craft supplies you've accumulated, then you're not going to want to use them. And the best tonic for that is just to sit down with your supplies and play with them and have fun and use them. And uh, don't be afraid of using them up because if you use them up, they're still making them. You can still buy more. There's very few products out there that I regret not buying. And usually they're products that I didn't know about until after I heard they were discontinued. So um, yeah, I guess they weren't that, that, that important when they were out there because I didn't even know about them. So give yourself a break sometimes. Don't beat yourself up if you bought stuff that you didn't use. Um, try using it if it's not your cup of tea. Don't feel bad about passing it along to someone who can use it and create. Just try to consume less and create more, I guess, um, unless you want to consume more. I, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. I don't want to sound... Um, like I'm prescribing anything to anyone because I'm certainly not perfect in this regard and none of us are. So I just want to be the best version of myself. I want to help you be the best version of yourself. I will provide as much information about these different supplies as possible and inspiration on them. But if watching my reviews makes you want to spend, it makes you want to buy everything, then I give you permission not to watch my reviews. If that, if that's something that is, is making you struggle, I don't want to make you struggle. If it's something that help satisfy the itch. You're like, oh, okay, I got to see that. Now I guess I don't think I need it. Then by all means, watch them. We're all different. We're all going to be triggered by different things. And um, I just want to see people creating more because I know there's a lot of a lot of supplies out there that are just sitting, gathering dust on shelves. And that's the true waste. That's wasting the supply. It's not using it on a project that doesn't come out good. That's not the wasting of the supply. The wasting of the supply is having it sitting unused on the shelf, going dry in the tube, never getting used, and then um, thrown in a dumpster after we die or sold for pennies on the dollar after we die. We paid full price for it. We might as well use it. Don't you think? Well, that's all I have for you today. I want to thank you so much for listening. I hope to have a guest on next week. So wish me luck for that. And as always, guys, happy crafting. Bye.